All right. Um, wonderful. We still have some people coming in, um, but uh, we were, we are as we're getting started. I just want to welcome all of you to the 2023 Medium Festival of Photography's online event series. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Amber Lucero Dwyer, and I'm a board member of Medium Photo, and I'm happy to have all of you here today. Um, and today we're welcoming uh, this online program, which is titled "A Field Guide to a Crisis" with with Justin Maxson. And I just want to uh, before we get started, I want to just introduce Justin a little bit. And then I'll go over a little bit of our um, format. Um, so Justin Maxson is a socially engaged artist, photographer, filmmaker, and educator. He's a faculty member at the art department of Cal Poly Humboldt. He's, his socially engaged work often challenges authoritative knowledge systems through repositioning people within the social hierarchy. He collaborates with communities that are connected to his own positionality, making design and ideation de decisions with participants. His work has been funded by organizations such as the California Arts Council, the Magnum Foundation, the Aaron Siskin Foundation, and the National Geographic Society. Thank you very much for joining us today, Justin. Um, for those of you who are joining us live, we encourage you to uh, submit questions in the chat and I'll share relevant links uh, related to Justin's work in the chat after we get started. Um, and before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that Medium Photo operates from unceded lands of the Kumai, Kumai um, people, who are the original inhabitants of the San Diego and Tijuana region. Uh, the Kumai continue to call this land home and share their culture, stories, and art for the greater good. I'd like to express thanks to the Kumai Nation for sharing this land with Medium Photo and the programs that we produce. With that, I'm happy to turn the stage over to our guest speaker, Justin. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Amber. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here today on your Easter Sunday. And welcome to the fourth presentation of Field Guide to a Crisis. This socially engaged art project was co-conceptualized uh, with my partner, Marina Lopez. And it's designed for people in recovery from a substance abuse disorder <clears throat> living in Humboldt County, California, to help prepare them to become teachers in resiliency using the skills they learned in their own recovery. And the project has been generously funded by the California Arts Council, National Geographic Society, Center for the Photographic Art, and Humboldt Area Foundation. And before we begin, I just want to give a quick overview of how our time will be structured today. Um, our total one time is a little bit over 50 minutes, and then afterwards we'll have some time for um, questions if you have any. Um, first, we're going to give quick introductions, then I will introduce the project, talk about the philosophy behind it, the framework, what we've done, what we're currently doing. <clears throat> then Brianna and Sabrina will share their skill and read a short narrative story, followed by Q&A with Sabrina, and then we'll finish up with a work in progress performance um, by Alexa. I will start the introductions. Um, Amber mentioned, my name is Justin Maxson. I'm the project director um, and creator. I'm a social practice artist with a background in photography, and I have 18 years of clean time. So who would like to go next? <clears throat> I'll go. Hi, my name is Alexa. I'm a Finnish American filmmaker and I have nine years clean time. Hello, I'm Sabrina. I'm um, a creative community member and I have five years clean time. Hi, I'm Brianna. I'm a mom and I'm a caregiver. I have four, clean, four years clean. Awesome. <clears throat> so just give me one second. Uh, we'll get into the project. I'm going to start a slideshow. <clears throat> An essential question that we are confronting with this work is who do we normally turn to in times of crisis? You know, typically, it's experts who have been bona fide by institutions or social hierarchies. But what about experts of experience? Those who have dealt with the loss of community amongst crisis, like people in recovery. 
you know, society traditionally turns away from them out of projected shame and stigma. So with this work, we are asking people to rethink the voices that are elevated in times of crisis. And what it does is it repositions people in recovery as experts by activating the skills that they have developed as strategies for survival, where participants get the opportunity to present and teach their skills um, with lesson plans, instructional videos, public presentations, and workshops. And photography, in many ways, is the backbone for this work, but by no means it's the end product. For me, as uh, a socially engaged artist, storytelling needs to be a responsive process to meet the needs of whatever communities in collaboration. So in this context, photography represents an essential tool for participants to translate their skill in real time because it's the most accessible medium. And therefore, it's easy for people to imagine themselves in a photograph. And the way the project begins is that each participant uh, mm -hmm. is led through a series of exercises to identify their own accumulated skills. They then select the one skill they want included in the project and create a series of textual, photographic, and video-based pieces. And this includes um, a skill description, a simple set of instructions, a narrative backstory that speaks to a birthing moment of their skill, a warning label that describes how if the skill is not used properly, it may cause harm to yourself or, or others, a, a collaborative photograph demonstrating their skill, which is then turned into a line drawing, and then finally, a, an instructional video. And then once participants have identified, named, and visualized their skill, they then create a lesson plan consisting of a series of assignments that completes the transition from student to teacher. Now, here's an example with um, Gary Hartford. Um, his lesson is called the heater exercise, where he made a series of ingenious heaters using whatever material he had available to him uh, while he was living houseless in the state of Washington. And here are a few examples. We have the tin, uh, the Copenhagen tin snuff. We have a Campbell soup hand sanitizer. Obviously that's not a Campbell soup, um, but that's what we had at the time. We had the TP bricks, the AKA fire donut. And these heaters um, are for emergency use only um, to prevent frostbite on fingers and toes. And for each one, he wrote out a series of instructions, um, such as the pros, the cons, the cost, the duration, the ingredients, and the steps. Now, Gary is part of the first cohort of students, and each cohort consists of 10 individuals, and they normally stay in the project for around 12 to 24 months. And this group before you that's presenting today represents the second cohort. Um, and we've only been working together for around four to five months. So the work is in progress, um, still things to be done. Now, one of the biggest delights for me in this work is discovering the varied and sometimes eccentric skills people have. And in many cases, these skills are strengths that they've never recognized in themselves before. You know, For example, Aaron Ochoa's skill of taking care of shit before it builds up. He, he spends his days problem solving so things don't turn into messes. Here's Aaron Panola, his skill of living in the present. He smells the flowers wherever he goes and works to appreciate the ups and the downs of life. Here's Michelle M. Miller, her skill is random acts of kindness and she's always on the lookout for situations that could use acts of care. She writes them down in a notepad and then at some point later on when she has the time she'll revisit that moment and that that space and and do that act of care <clears throat> and with the work compiled from the first cohort we've made a series of public engagements we published a book two different versions one a higher end copy and then another uh, a newsprint version we made a website and we've done a series of online presentations and once participants 
go through the project, they, they graduate, they then get the opportunity to be paid mentors for any uh, incoming students. You know, for example, Michelle M. Miller, like I mentioned from the first cohort, she's currently being paid as a mentor for um, this current group. And then in the summer, Sabrina Miller is actually gonna be paid as an organizer for a third cohort. Um, so you may ask what my connection to this work is. Um, this project is part of my long-term commitment to offering a community and story-centered approach to substance abuse recovery in this region. <clears throat> And Eureka is my hometown. And like I mentioned before, substance abuse is, is no stranger. And my fortunate path led me to a committed mentor who eventually became my, my adopted father. <clears throat> and this is a photograph of him on the left. His name is Resendo Medina. And he's pictured here um, taking an alcohol bottle from a man that he was mentoring at the time, trying to help him get sober. And he saw strengths in me that I was unable to recognize recognize in myself at the time, which helped me reconsider the value that I held within my community. And one of the ways that we communicated was through letters. And here's a passage that he wrote to me um, in 2003. Justin, son, sit and open your mind to your own inner wisdom. You're making progress right on schedule. A warrior's life is not about imagined perfection or victory. It's about love. Love is a warrior's sword. Wherever it cuts, it gives life, not death. Love can only be felt. He unfortunately tragically passed away in, in 2019. But his memory lives on in me as I continue to work with people in recovery to help provide a space for them to more clearly see their own value. So thank you again so, so much for being here today. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass the mic to Brianna. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Brianna Nazarchuk. And my, life, my skill is synchronicity. Life is a highway, there are so many turnoffs and so many signs. How do we know which ones to follow? Seeing the right signs is my specialty and I know that I'm here for a reason. There is a purpose for me still being here. I've tried to kill myself a few times and there's been a multiple times where I should have died, but I didn't. I know that we're all intertwined with each other and we all met for a reason. I see signs all over the place usually for any given moment. Given message, there are two or more at the same time. It is magic and you just have to trust. If some shitty things happen to you in your life, some people might be lost by it. I ended up getting raped and that's how I lost my virginity. They use a date rape drug. And even though a lot of people would hold on to that pain, I realized I went through it for a reason. And the reason was for me to break a cycle the cycle of abuse. My mom got beat when I was in the womb by my dad, and then I ended up getting involved with someone that was just like him. Synchronicity keeps me moving forward. It's all about change, and I have to go through it to get out of it. And that's what I did with my ex. I finally went through it, and I got out of it. My next relationship will not be violent. It will, be not, it will not be hateful, and it's going to be love, unconditional love. The universe is never going to fail me, and I just need to follow the signs. The way that it works is you hold a, crush, a question in your mind. Is there a struggle you're grappling with that you want to work towards resolving? Can you identify your ideal outcome? If you're uncertain about the outcome, maybe what you're looking for is clarity. Hold that question in your mind through one whole day. Take a walk or drive through your neighborhood or town and be receptive to the signs around you for an answer. Uh, this skill definitely comes with a warning uh, when it comes to synchronicities and following signs. Noticing when a sign is a warning versus an affirmation is a very critical observation that needs to be made. Don't procrastinate when you see the signs, otherwise they get confusing and you may end up on the wrong path. 
Next, I'm gonna share a backstory that shows my journey with synchronicity as my guide. Uh, the big road trip with signs as you go. In December of 2014, I had a dream. My grandma came to me and she took my hand with hers. She was a younger version of herself, solid, warm, and alive. She walked me through a long corridor with blaring wet, white light. It felt like heaven. It was the light that everyone was ta that everyone talks about. Was I dead? The walls of the corridor were lined with images, but instead of pictures, there were projections of my memories, streaming past us as stable as air. And at the end, she said, everything's gonna be all right. I woke up with, with an overwhelming sensation that no matter what was next, everything would be all right. A lot of things happened all at once. Michigan was telling me I had to leave. I was diagnosed with Raynaud's, which is an autoimmune syndrome. And your hands and your feet get really, really painful, like pins and needles. It is triggered by cold and stress, which Michigan was both cold and stressful. Uh, my doctor told me to get into a warmer environment and avoid stress. My car broke down in the middle of the intersection and I sat stranded crying while people are honking mercilessly around me. I was like, yes, I chose to break down right here. At the time, I was in a long-term relationship with someone who had kids. We'd been taking the next steps to building our future when I found out he was cheating on me. By the time I lost my winter jacket, the temperature at negative five and four feet of snow on the ground, I knew I had to go. I'd hit rock bottom and that's when the signs became more clear. They were all pointing west. I broke up with my ex, which was a really hard decision to make because I took, took care of his kids from two up till eight. And I had to sit down with them and tell them the truth. Things aren't working out between your dad and me, and but you'll have a new mom. What made me happy through it all was that I kept the kids out of CBS. They had got taken away from their mom originally because she tried killing them. She left the windows open in the winter with them naked in their cribs. So I moved in March. I threw a goodbye birthday party for myself as I was turning 24. That evening, two of my best friends and I had a sleepover. The next day, they reported me driving off, which was a really sad video. My car was driving down this little alleyway as they said goodbye, telling me that they'd hope I found what I was looking for. From there, I made my I made my way to my grandma's, then to my mom's, and then I said I said all of my goodbyes, and I took a two week trip down to Florida to see my aunt. Then I hit the road, ready for the next thing. And I remember the feeling of possibility even as the rain came pouring down and my windshield wipers worked without a pause. I made it to Texas and I planned to stay with a friend who had two kids in exchange for free rent. I would watch her kids. But at that point, I was mothered out and I needed to take care of myself. She ended up getting pregnant two weeks after I moved there. I was like, this is a sign I need to, I need to leave. Because before I moved to Michigan, I lived with another friend and she got pregnant two weeks into my stay there. I've had quite a few people get pregnant being around me and I don't even have a penis. So now I'm leaving Texas, making my way to California. My friend said she could get me a job chopping down trees and I literally thought chopping down trees. I'm like, let's, let's get this small person from Flint, Michigan to be a lumberjack. People used to call me a guy, so I was ready for it. Let's do it. But when I was here, I wasn't cutting down trees, but trimming weed. When I moved to Humble, I had to wait a month to move into my place, so I ended up staying at the Red Roof Inn. And when I was checking in, the front desk attendant ended up having a girlfriend with the same name as me, and who was actually there planning on moving to Michigan. Uh, and then when I was a child, I would sit in my grandma's grandma's yard in this patch of earth. It was a per perfect circle of clovers all around me, and I would meditate and try to find a four leaf, but I never found one until I moved to Humboldt County. It was March 15th, 
and I told someone I was going to find a board leaf before in St. Patty's and ended up finding one that day on my grandma's, grandma's birthday. The end. Thank you for listening. Up next is Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina again, and my skills responding on the fly. My art form is allowing life to come to me. I'm sort of a real pro life improv actor in a way, and I see myself as a performer on the stage of life. I can be sort of like a formless amoeba floating aimlessly through the vast infinite ether of space and time. And I think that I was created to be the universe's sidekick because it knows that I'm down for anything. And it always feels like I'm being chosen for the missions no one else wants to take on. My adaptable nature has allowed me to experience a vast array of life's many happenings from the deviant drug addict to the community oriented social change agent. I'm always changing and growing depending on life's circumstances. I don't live life with any particular goals or ideas of what I think my life should look like. And this mentality has allowed me to make the most of out of any circumstance and has expanded the many dimensions of my character to create the very complex multifaceted being that I have become. Responding on the fly is a skill that works best when you're able to let go of attachments to expectations and just let life come to you in whatever form it takes. Life doesn't always give you what you want, but it usually gives you what you need. And if you can learn to let go and trust the process, you'll find that things come your way, that the things that come your way are meant to find you and shape you into the person that you truly are. This might mean going along with some experiences and circumstances that may make you feel a bit uncomfortable at first, but learning how to be adaptable and open to receiving will help you to expand beyond your limits. I like to think of life as a performance, my own personal work of art, the art of effortless living, learning to flow and let life unfold in a harmonious manner without trying to control, dancing the dance of life and responding instead of forcing. Now there is a warning on this skill, I should say. If you're always responding to things without any contemplation, you might get yourself into some pretty crazy situations. Also getting wrapped up, getting too wrapped up in your own performance may result in a lot of drama and potentially detachment from reality. All right, now I'm gonna read a short story that I wrote um, titled The Magic Little Pill, which is sponsored by Big Pharma. In the midst of my own chaos, I realized that destruction could be beautiful. Up until then, I never really felt like life was anything special. Everything felt pretty boring and monotonous, which is why I usually spent most of my time escaping into fantasies or sleeping my life away. It was a chore for me to just get through the days. Then life began to serve me chaos, mainly in the form of drugs, but it took many forms. I welcomed the change of pace because it helped me break away from the control of my upbringing. Finally, for the first time, I began to experience elements of life that I had never even dreamed were possible. I think the first major catalyst was when I started taking psych meds. All through my life, I had always struggled with the element of school that required me to focus, sit still, and concentrate all of my energy on schoolwork for hours on end. I managed to skate by in primary school because I was smart enough to ace all my tests and do my homework last minute, but once I got to college, it became a lot more challenging for me to bullshit my way through. It was my freshman year. A new friend of mine had told me about her condition that prevented her from being able to focus in school. Okay, I totally related to this. I also couldn't focus in school. Luckily, she told me about the solution, Adderall. One little pill and suddenly she was able to hyper-focus on her schoolwork. What, a miracle pill that could solve all of my problems? I had to have it. She let me sample some of her medicine and wow, I had never known this much euphoria in all of my life. Suddenly the most mundane tasks became exuberating as my brain flooded with dopamine and neuropinephrine. I was able to find so much joy in my homework that I managed to work on it for hours. Yay, all of my problems were solved, except they weren't because she couldn't give me any more pills since she needed to take them too. This was a major problem because now I knew what true joy felt like and I couldn't possibly do one more assignment in a regular state of consciousness again. Clearly I needed this medication. Clearly I have some sort of mental illness that requires me to have my own prescription for this medication. I began to conduct research online to locate information that would prove I was in need of the medicine to cure my illness. 
I compiled a series of documents and made an appointment with my primary care doctor to share my concerns about my health crisis and to assure her that I knew exactly what I needed to get well. I have ADHD, I told her. I have all the symptoms that the internet lists as symptoms, and it's undeniable that this mental illness is why, since childhood, I haven't been able to sit still for hours on end and focus on schoolwork. There's clearly no other possibility. But fear not, Doc. I know for a fact that Adderall will set me straight. The internet says it's a sure solution. <clears throat> my doctor must have been impressed with my research because she agreed that the internet was right. I was clearly ADHD and no further tests or conversation was needed to prove it because facts are facts. So she prescribed me my Adderall and from that point on, I would never be the same again. See, now most people typically start at a dose of around 10 milligrams a day, but my doctor must have seen how mentally unstable I really was because she prescribed me a whopping 60 milligrams, two 30 milligram pills a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon to keep the high fresh. Thanks to her careful consideration, I was flying high. I had never experienced so much euphoria on a daily basis. My entire life went from black and white to an iridescent rainbow of flashing lights. I was diligent in taking my required dose because, well, doctor's orders. I even called my doctor to let her know 60 milligrams just wasn't enough. I actually needed more. And since she cared so much about my well being, she bumped me up to 90 milligrams a day. And now I was soaring. I can't say whether or not my schoolwork improved because honestly, I spent most of my highs tweaking around on the internet for hours or getting into deep, endless conversations with all of my friends who also were getting prescribed this magical little pill. But life was great. Only I was suddenly experiencing a lot of anxiety. It was almost as if this high dosage of Adderall was having negative side effects. Well, luckily my doctor had a solution, three milligrams of Xanax a day. Now I was in balance. Adderall to lift me up, Xanax to bring me back down, a pharmaceutical speedball. Now I'm sure you can only imagine the state of being that this cocktail wound up creating for me. I was becoming more and more unstable by the day. Me and my best friend, who was also on a similar regimen as me, would channel our severe mental instability onto all sorts of wild antics. We would break into random buildings on campus, steal all sorts of random stuff, scream and shout in public places to intentionally cause a scene. One time we even held a seance where we sacrificed our soul to Satan for nothing. No matter what we were doing, it always involved some sort of ridiculous drama. Some may say I was manic depressive. Well, luckily there's a diagnosis for this too. It's called bipolar disorder. And luckily there's also a medication for this. They're called mood stabilizers. And of course, good old primary care doctor hooked me up with some of those as well. You know, thank goodness she never made me see a psychologist to get any of these meds. That would have been a way more complicated process. Now, I didn't necessarily mean to become addicted to pills. I was simply oppressed by institutionalized education. I had no idea what I was getting myself into when I started requesting these medications. But here I was, 19 years old, pill-induced bipolar disorder, really moving through adolescence in true American fashion. Life was horrible but also amazing. It was everything all at once. And I had never been so miserable, but also elated. I was everything all at once. Oh, well, oh, well, here, I'm, here I am now. Might as well be as chaotic as possible. And this is where I really started coming into my skill. Me as the performer of my own life and seeing life as my art, no matter what happened to me, I was in for the ride. I really began to feel at home in this new state of being, and I made sure that every moment spent was one where I was truly embracing and embodying the role that I had fallen into. I would go out of my way to be as crazy and fucked up as possible, and I took pride in being a grimy, mentally unstable drug addict and found a lot of value in that identity. I was constantly invoking chaos into my life, and what some people would call fuck-ups, I would call relics of my epic tale. The end. <clears throat> um, so next, I'm going to do a little question and answer, um, responding on the fly. Thanks so much for being that, Sabrina. So the first question I have is, why did you start using drugs? Um, I started using drugs mainly because they made me feel good. You know, they brought me to new heights, and I spent most of my life numb and repressed. And suddenly these substances would open up my mind and allow me to access all these states of consciousness that I never even knew existed. 
Show us an expression of the person that you were back then. Back then I was pretty like crazy and chaotic and I thought I was so cool. So it was probably something like, yeah, you know, fuck you world. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you decide to get sober? Mm, I think that, you know, I realized that enough, enough would never be enough. Um, at the peak of my addiction, I was basically like chain smoking and shooting meth on a daily basis. And I realized that that was completely unsustainable. Um, I was also doing like a lot of acid and DMT at the time. So it was basically doing so much heavy drugs all at once. I started having visions about the future life I was supposed to be living, which included like moving out West, chasing my dreams, getting clean. Um, and I had to follow that vision. Okay. Um, please play us a sober tune on your guitar. Okay. <clears throat> I don't want to do drugs no more. I have way too much to live for. I'm going to move out, move out west and chase my dreams. Love is the prize or so it seems. Um, my next question is make a poem about this mission that you had for yourself using 10 words. 10 words. All right. See, uh, traversing timelines, opening portals, the new world will rise again. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned that you have a lot of experience um, in the social change world. Um, demonstrate what the social what social change work looks like from the outside. From the outside, I would say it looks pretty, you know, noble and you know, valiant, but you know, rah, rah, save the world, bring down okay. the system. So tell me something about social change work from the inside. Okay. From the inside being in it, mm -hmm. I realized it was actually, um, can be pretty self-serving and toxic. I found that a lot of people doing the work were really recreating a lot of the same systems and patterns and dynamics that they were preaching to be against. And it's, yeah, filled with a lot of people who were projecting their need for power and control onto the work that they were doing. And don't get me wrong, there was a lot of amazing people in it. And um, I met a lot of really amazing, genuine people through the process, but yeah, there was definitely a lot of toxicity in it. Okay, how do you honor yourself today? Today I honor myself by um, just practicing unconditional love for myself, standing firm in my truth, placing good boundaries, um, and just going with the flow of nature and like surrendering to the natural world is my higher power. Nice. Um, what's your favorite dance move right now? Um, my favorite dance move right now is probably just like, you know, like flow, twirl, <laughs> just anything to embody the, the flow of life that I like to um, go with. So, yes. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah, Sabrina. no problem. Thank you, everyone. Um, up next, not only is she a pioneer in the world of art, film, collage, modern dance, and now oil painting, but she's also a damn fine lady. Give it up for Alexa. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina, for those shenanigans. Um, hi, everyone. Hello again. My name is Alexa. And my skill is seeing my part in things or tackling resentments. Okay. So the dictionary definition of resentments is bitter indignation of having been treated unfairly. Okay. As I'm talking, I'm going to be sharing an experimental film that I made about my relationship to an experience with resentments. Just the imagery of it. Um, Boop, boop. Okay. Taking responsibility for my part in things is the antidote to resentments. First, I have to stop focusing on the fair and unfair aspects of it. Sorry. Please hold. I think she's running. <clears throat> okay. 
First, I have to stop focusing on the fair and unfair aspects of it. Life isn't meant to be fair or unfair. It just is. Do I think it's unfair that a lion eats a gazelle? Usually, I can see my part in a fight with a friend or a loved one. But sometimes, especially with a stranger, it seems impossible to allocate any blame whatsoever on myself. So I sit and simmer with this resentment, telling myself it's justified, defending my rage to myself. Doing that is taking something that hurt you once and elongating that pain into a daily ordeal. The Buddhists call it the second arrow. The first arrow is the physical one that hit you and hurt you. But this one can be removed and healed from. The second arrow is the bemoaning of the first one. The why did this have to happen to me feeling and life's unfair sentiment. The point of letting go of resentments is to free myself of that burden. Once I can accept responsibility for my part in things, I'm no longer at the mercy of the whims of the world and the people in it. I'm free to choose to stay in suffering or not. Uh, the way it works is the next time you find yourself stuck on a resentment, just stop, take a breath, and ask yourself, what part am I playing in this resentment? Letting go of resentments doesn't mean tolerating bad behavior. In fact, tolerating it is your part. So our responsibility as grown-ups to take care of ourselves. So don't, don't use giving up resentments as an excuse to accrue more. All right. And now I'm very pleased to share with you my work in progress of the upcoming performance titled The Monkey Made Me Do It. I'm 16. My mom says I'm full of piss and vinegar. The adults around me call it teenage angst, like they think I'm funny. They exchange amused looks over my head as if I can't see what they're doing. I'm right here, guys. Adults are rude like that, certain of their age and doubt superiority. Personally, I don't think they have a leg to stand on, considering the state of the world they're about to hand over to us. My big brother, he tells me to chill. He insists that things aren't that bad. He gets frustrated with my frustration. He says nothing can make me happy. He has a point. So far, nothing has made me happy. He believes that whatever you put into the world, you get out. Some kind of hippy-dippy law of attraction mindset. He contends it's my resting bitch face that turns people off. I will begrudgingly admit I've always admired the way he can coax a person out of their shell, get a perfect stranger to smile, not an easy feat when it comes to the stoic, no-nonsense fins. Lately, I've been considering his logic, and I can't find fault in it. If I want to see some change around here, it really does have to start with me. Be the change you want to see, and so forth and so on, yada, yada, yada. It's early morning, and the cold assaults me like a smack. It's still dark outside, and it will be dark by the time I leave school at 3 p.m. But hey, who needs daylight with weather like this? The tips of my still damp hair begin immediately hardening to frozen hairsicles, a typical winter day. Sometimes I think about my ancestors and their incomprehensible choice to settle here. It must have been just one big great misunderstanding. They came during the summer, saw the sun never set, found the bottomlessly bountiful lakes, ate berries and mushrooms until their bellies ached, thought they had discovered paradise itself set up camp, lay down roots, and then, six months later, woke up to find themselves in a hellish icecape of never-ending night and forever snow. Whoops. When they tried to turn around, all the neighboring lands put their hands down onto the seat next to them and said, this seat is taken, like so many grade school bullies. I've done my full face of makeup as usual. I'm really good at makeup, if I do say so myself. My long cat eyes extend out, sleek, thinning out as they arch up. I'm wearing little geisha lips, just the middle of my mouth colored in. It's my battle paint, but this time I aim to do good in the world. As the bus pulls up to my stop, I graciously move aside to let everyone else enter first. The old man leaning on his cane with a fur cap that doesn't quite cover his ears. He looks like he shouldn't be out alone without a keeper. He looks like he'd regale you with stories from when the Soviet Union was our frenemy and you could only order beer with a meal. The classic middle-aged lady wrapped in her cloud of perfume. I always wondered why it always trailed and never led. You can't smell her coming, 
but you know where she's been. The twenty-something disgruntled goth with his dyed jet black mane making his skin a lighter shade of pasty. His just extinguished cigarette stench battling for airspace with the queen of perfume. No one seems to notice my act of grace. Or maybe they take it for granted that the young should enter last. No, I'm not going to think that way this morning. Be the change. I shuffle in and show the bus driver my monthly pass. The drivers are supposed to check the pictures to ensure you're not using someone else's pass. But I had a friend once use a pass that had Mickey Mouse pasted over her picture for two years before anyone said anything. I attempt to make eye contact. The driver is a dour looking man, middle-aged, overweight, the kind of body you get from decades of sausage and beer on a daily, so a traditional Finnish diet. His eyes are shifty and won't meet mine, so I up the arsenal. I let a fake cheerful, good morning, escape my lips. Even as the words are forming, I know my mistake. That was so goddamn loud. I flush red and get instantly hot. I can feel my armpits getting wet. They are oozing the sweat only an agitated amygdala can produce. Curiosity has turned the packed bus to stare at me. The driver raises his eyes from my past to my face and lets out a nonplussed grunt as a reply. He sounds like a pig. On closer inspection, he looks like one too. I slink deeper into the belly of the beast, eyes locked on the ground, hard, willing myself with all my might to stay composed. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. I have to stand with my arm up, holding onto a plastic strap since there's no seats available, my face exposed for all to see. Staring at the ground is my best cover. Then the tears come, out in the open for all to see. Big, fat, salty fuckers. At least they are silent, leaky giveaways. At least I'm not hyperventilating and then hiccuping as, my, as was my way throughout most of childhood. Trying in vain to compose myself to stupid commands of idiot adults. Hey, come on now, don't cry. This isn't anything to cry about. Crying harder with each mortified sob that I couldn't control. I grasp hopefully at the thought that maybe someone thinks I'm crying over a recently deceased parent or family member. Maybe they think I got raped or evicted. That they don't connect my leaky membranes to the tiny disc from a morning route bus driver. What kind of weirdo would shed tears over that? Still, a teeny tiny part of me feels vindicated. I spend the entire 25 minute bus trip rehearsing in my head the speech I will deliver this afternoon to my shit for brains brother. I will tell him that I'm now confident resting bitch face is the way to go. Honed in teenagehood in freezing Finland, this face will someday get me through catcalls in Spain and subway harassment in New York City. For the moment, the tears have stopped, but the expression remains. Sure, I feel pretty dried up inside, pretty hollow, but the emptiness brings about it a sense of familiar numb, which is much preferable to the thumping, vulnerable hurt of exposure. I feel a sense of power in the detachment. Isn't it fitting that from these frozen tundras should emerge such an ice queen? <clears throat> I'm 28. It's 12 years later and things have somewhat come undone. The blanket of numb I learned to swag myself in during adolescence proved itself insufficient when dealing with bigger hurts of life. Life turned out to be more difficult, less fulfilling, and vastly more disappointing than what I was prepared for. I had to reach for stronger sedatives. So I've become addicted to China white heroin, and now there's a monkey on my back. In the 90s, I saw a movie called Monkey Shines where a man in a wheelchair gets a monkey as a support animal, but the monkey turns evil on him and tries to kill him, kind of like how addiction works. This is the first time my monkey has arrived. This is the first time I'm jonesing, that I need to get high right now. This isn't a supposedly spontaneous thought, guiding me to my phone, a text, and depositing me inevitably to my couch a few hours later, to the seemingly innocent act of nodding off in candlelight to Leonard Cohen and the simple perfection of a self-soothing grown-up lullaby. It's not optional. If I don't get high, the walls will cave in. Spiders will start crawling up and down the inside of the skin of my thighs. I can feel their hairy legs, a tingling like a phantom limb. There's some odd large eels swimming around in my stomach, 
There they are sloshing around. And if I'm not about to be high out of my fucking mind, I'm going to scream. My boyfriend and I stalk each other like starved animals cooped up in his tiny rented room. We snap at each other, each, demand, each demanding that the other make it right. We blow up my dealer's phone all day until he finally allows us over. It's dark by now. The flood of relief his agreeing to us has brought is quickly replaced by a blanket of paranoia. The streets feel menacing, empty, too empty, like an abandoned movie set or a setup. I'm sure we're about to get pulled over. Somehow, they're going to nail us before we even have the chance to score. We'll stumble on our words and they'll take us in. But the cops don't get us that day. It doesn't occur to me that we might get pulled over after we get the drugs. Because after we get the drugs, we'll be high. And when you're high, you don't worry about anything. I'm scared of no cops when I'm high. Besides, I carry the junk in my underpants where they can't search me until I'm arrested. And they can't arrest me unless they find the junk. Infallible logic. The car seems to be floating along in the silent dark streets. And I can feel that monkey perched up there. Right shoulder, heavy, ominous. When we get to our dealer's house, my boyfriend goes up and gets the shit. He gets to do a line in the living room while I sit in the car. But when I want to do a line in the car before we drive off, he protests, not here, not fucking here. Did you just do a fucking line up there? Well, I'm fucking doing one too. I'm sorry, my screen went dark. Oh. <clears throat> Somewhere along the line, I've started talking like that, vicious and rude and desperate. I don't try to explain myself to myself. The monkey made me do it. I'm 34 years old. I've been sober for five years. As you might've imagined, things continued to get out of hand since the monkey showed up. By the time I was 29, the wheels had completely fallen off the bus. I had thrown in the towel and had crawled my way into AA. I made my bumbling way through the 12 steps and started to feel a never before experienced emotion, okayness, not elation, not despair, just wonderful, ordinary, non-blissful, everything is okay-ness. Things had remained rather okay for the past half decade. Every so often I'd traverse my way through the steps again as a sort of spiritual house cleaning. Each time I'd discover some new kingdom of Looked over dust bunnies lurking in a corner I thought I'd already swept up. Currently, I'm on the fourth step again. I've been on the fourth step for some months now. The fourth step is the one where most people drop off and relapse. <clears throat> it's the one where you list each and every resentment you've ever had throughout your entire life. And then you look at your part in it. Gulp. And I do mean each and every resentment. Even the time a bus driver dissed you on the morning route little shit like that. You might want to argue for its insignificance. Many addicts have. What's the point in holding on to something like that? I'm not mad about that anymore, you might say. But it's vital that you include every slight you've ever encountered and be honest about what bothered you. I didn't get too deep with the fourth step the first two times around because I wouldn't admit to having any resentments I didn't think I should have had. I only liked my justified resentments. I was embarrassed about the petty ones. There were so many I thought were unwarranted and that I shouldn't have. So I just didn't cop to them. And there they remained, festering like thorns in my side, and bothering the shit out of me. My current list contains about 90 names. It's the first time I'm really being honest and thorough, and it makes me want to rip my skin off. I did mom and dad and had a burning hot coals adventure of emotions spelling out the ways I felt they fucked up as parents. And then a waterfall of tears of forgiveness when I uncovered their childhoods. It kind of put everything into perspective. Turns out my great grandpa was Jack Nicholson from The Shining. He had a habit of getting stupendously drunk and then grabbing an ax and chasing his kids and wife out into that blistering Finnish winter where they'd escape by running into the tall snow banks his drunken legs could not master. Little Kaisu, Lempi, Paula, and Ero, and their powerless mother Helia screaming, Run, children! Yes, if I'm being honest, I missed a certain kind of love, a certain kind of unconditional acceptance from my dad growing up. I felt there should have been more cuddles, more playing, more encouragement. I grew up thinking I wasn't enough for him because whatever I achieved, 
He urged me to be better, to try a little harder next time. It distressed me. Already an anxious child, I would stay up nights to cram for tests, having discovered the academic realm to be the only one in which I could shine and not be fully overshadowed shadowed by my twin. Not to say he couldn't get good grades if he wanted to. Usually he just didn't give a shit. I did. I gave lots of shits. Whatever might be said about my father's misguided parenting style, my dad never chased me into the snowbank with an ax, not even once. And to escape the tradition that you come from is to overcome an imprinting of biological forces. That's not easy. Mom's dad was a drunk too, a binger. He would remain sober for weeks or, weeks or even months until something seemingly trivial set him off and away he went, gone for God knows how long or where to. My grandmother, a somewhat desperate housewife of the 50s and 60s, turned to her eldest daughter for comfort and solace. That's called parentification, when the kid is put in the role of parenting the parent. My mother later took the mantle and passed it to me. As I kept up my vigilant, no stone left and turned journey into the center of myself, I eventually bumped into the bus driver. That decades old resentment towards a bus driver who didn't appreciate my good morning greeting. Talk about cleaning up the skeletons in your closet. The implications froze me solid for a few weeks. Am I really so soft skinned that any stranger can puncture me like that? It's a new depth to my vulnerability and it scares me. Does this mean I'll start crying in public again if I disarm myself and discard my resting bitch face? I've already given up my shield of drugs and alcohol, but how can I live in this world in salty New York City without a skin? I've been crying for weeks out of fear. In the fourth step, you learn how to take responsibility for your part in things. I'm finally seeing mine. It comes rushing at me like a brick wall. I take every fucking single thing personally. Everything. And that's my part. I take everything as a personal slight and I give it weight and importance. A bus driver was rude to me 20 years ago and I thought it meant something about me. I held on to this notion for decades and nursed it and polished it and spent time hating him and hating how I thought he made me feel. And forever after saw the bus driver and his imagined power over me and any unkind stranger on the street. What a horrible weight to carry. What a terrible burden. What relief to let go. Thank you for listening, y'all. So that's the end of our, of our time. So we have prepared. So thank you so much for being here. And if anyone has any questions, um, we would happily take your questions. I thoroughly um, appreciated all of you sharing your stories and your wisdom with all of us. That was such a pleasure um, and an experience for me. Um, and I'm sure for the others as well. I just wanna express my gratitude to all of you. Um, uh, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to join them in the chat. Um, but I know that uh, this was a really special experience. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone again, um, and as well our audience participants for joining us today. Um, and please know that uh, there are more online programs for the Medium 2023 Festival. So if you're if you're in San Diego, uh, please join the 2023 Medium Festival in person. But uh, if you are uh, not in San Diego, you are more than welcome to join um, more online events. Just go to mediumphoto.org to find out the schedule. But thank you so much to everyone. Um, wish you a, a great rest of the Easter holiday for those who celebrate. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone, Bye. for being here.